Our guest in this segment is Senator Mike Stewart, a candidate for Attorney General. Mike, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, great to have you in studio. Yeah, it's been great. I've been uh, here in the panhandle uh, since Monday morning, traveling around. I was in Jefferson County, back to Berkeley County. Back to Jefferson County have been some great. Uh, we've de- we've even done some door to door despite the weather. Oh my! And uh, everywhere from one. Uh, Did you use a raft? I mean, not, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, rowing your way along. We used an umbrella, <laughs> and uh, but I'll tell you, it's been some just some great visiting all around the Panhandle, and uh, there there are more townhomes in Berkeley County. I'm convinced than the rest of West Virginia combined. Oh yeah. And it's pretty remarkable to see the growth. So I represent, just so your listeners know. The area of Lincoln, Logan, Boone, and Southern Kanawha County. It's the antithesis of what you see in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, economic disparity, depression, call it what you will. Uh, folks who struggle every day to find jobs to be able to put food on their table. Here, there's just a wealth of jobs. I see help wanted signs everywhere. I see construction everywhere. And there's a sense of optimism here. So your struggle as I speak with people throughout this region is what happens to our farmland? What happens to our orchards? You know, I was over at Orr's yesterday and it's just remarkable. Anybody who, I'm sure everybody who's listening has been there, uh, but you got to see it uh, to believe it. It's remarkable. Those blossoms coming out on those trees, those emus who are uh, wandering outside. I just hope we don't look back 25, 30, 50 years from now and see just a hillside of townhomes as opposed to just that beautiful, Mm -hmm. beautiful land up there. Uh, But as attorney general, that's not my role. I'm going to leave it to the locals to decide how they develop what their priorities are in terms of the makeup of this region. That won't be my role, but I think it's an important discussion I know is happening all across this region today. What what is your role as the attorney general of should you win the the seat, Mike? Well, first and foremost, it's to advance the interests of West Virginia, and that means uh, looking at the legislature. And and I know I'm a conservative running for attorney general. No question, my record's conservative. Everything I've done is conservative. But whether we end up with a Democrat governor or Republican governor, whatever the wish is or whatever the will is of the legislature, those folks who represent the people of West Virginia, that will be my job is to advance those interests for the people of West Virginia, but also to push back against that extraordinary federal overreach that we see today coming from Washington. And it's just not in the area of coal and natural gas. It is in the area of farmland right across this country and you may not see it if you're not watching it closely here but we all these small farms all across our country those farms that help build this country have been uh, monopolized we have very small producers on an international stage right now so it makes it very very hard if you're a small farm and what i mean by small farms not 10 pigs and 10 cows it can be hundreds or thousands but it makes it very hard to go to market with those types of things so when i talk about federal overreach it's everything from the atf to the epa to dhhs it's going to be a very active effort I know Patrick Morrissey has been pretty active on this front, and we'll continue that effort. Now, my background, uh, for those folks who don't know, I I ran the Trump campaign in 2015-16. Then I went on to become the United States Attorney, uh, Bill Powell's counterpart in southern West Virginia. My record there working in the federal courts, pretty big record. I prosecuted for the first time in West Virginia history two corrupt members of the state Supreme Court. And for anybody who doesn't know, there are only five members. And so we took two of those members out. And what do we have today? We perhaps have the most stable, reliable, most confident Uh, Supreme Court we've ever had in the history of West Virginia. So sometimes you have to go through those dark periods of time to get to better periods of time. My record also includes the largest Medicaid fraud prosecution in the history of West Virginia, the largest elder fraud prosecution in the history of West Virginia, some of the largest drug takedowns in the history of West Virginia. And the stat Uh, that I think sums it all up is during my term, my team uh, was able to take enough fentanyl off the streets to kill more than 40 million people in a state of 1.75 million. 
So think about that. We could have killed every man, woman, child across West Virginia 20 sometimes over just from the fentanyl that was taken off the streets there. And I do carry this wallet if you're with me any period of time. Uh, I talk about these all the time. These families stick with me all the time. Uh, it's filled with the faces of the victims of the opioid crisis. And uh, I think about them often because I do have a sense of urgency to try to see what we can't do to move past this. Over the past two years and every two-year period of time, we lose more people to opioid overdose then we're lost during the entirety of the Vietnam War, just to put it in perspective. And at some point, at some point, we have to shepherd the forces, we have to shepherd the will, we have to get the strategic plan, not to just flood the market with dollars to make us feel better about it. We have to get to points of solution. And I believe in rehab and treatment. I think they're critically important. But I also think we ought to be a little harsher on drug dealers, the ones who are feeding the poisons into our communities. And so as attorney general, I'll have a sense of urgency every day, just like I did as United States attorney. But the issues first, I'm going to focus on the opioid crisis. Right now, we have a first foundation in which we have almost a billion dollars that's fed in to try to end this opioid scourge. But I want every listener to understand what's happening with that money already. You know, most of that money already is being used to pay legacy jail bills in our counties. That's not going to do anything to solve the opioid crisis. I certainly hope, and we've got some really good folks that serve on the board of that first foundation, but this is once in a lifetime, a historic opportunity to change the page in terms of this opioid crisis. I intend to lead that effort as attorney general to work collaboratively with the folks that serve on that board, but to make sure we have a plan and a way to measure it so that we can see the impact we're having. But if we go through a billion dollars meant to solve this crisis and we don't do anything to solve it, we're going to end up with an opioid crisis at the end of the day. And I think it's just a crying shame. Mike, I thought there were strings attached to this money that it had to be used, something directly related to drug abuse and recovery. So it's all in, you know, remember we had this president who said, it depends on what the meaning of is, is. You know, we get into the definition of what words are. I can tell you that my view is that legacy jail costs in counties, and listen, this is a big burden on counties. I'm one of the few people, and as attorney general, I won't have this authority, but I've been saying this for years. The jail bill needs to be in Charleston, not the responsibility of every county. You may not see it as much here, but when and I had a magistrate appear before me in a Senate committee. It was fascinating. And I said, do you feel pressure as a magistrate when it comes to bail, to grant bail to borderline dangerous offenders to try to manage the jail bill? I was shocked. The answer, one word, yes. I think that's a real problem, right? If, you, if you're borderline dangerous, you shouldn't be back on the streets immediately until there's a dangerous assessment that's made to make sure the public is safe. These jail bills, we're gonna to have to have a broader discussion in West Virginia about it, because when a magistrate lets somebody back on the streets here in Martinsburg, this isn't 1890 anymore. You get in the car and you travel around. An offender put out on bail in Martinsburg can easily make it to any other town in West Virginia or Maryland or Virginia or Pennsylvania and wreak havoc. And so we need to be smart about this. I think the jail bill is really a state issue, and I'd like to free up those resources for counties to invest. But again, not something I'll have control of as attorney general, but I understand these issues of crime and punishment and these county budgets in a way that I think is going to be very helpful mm -hmm. as attorney general. Bill? Yeah, uh, you've given me enough, uh, Mike, <laughs> that we can talk about for an hour and a half. But, yeah, there's a lot of uh, stuff and, there. And I do want to come back to the jail bill. Yeah. But very early in your campaign, uh, you made a statement that as uh, attorney general, you would assimilate or you would absorb some of the duties that are, that are housed in the county uh, a prosecuting attorney uh, and that created quite a stir and quite a, a pushback in other words the that you would do you would take it from the local level and move it to the state level you back you backed off that on that somewhat do you still what's your view now well I think I've crystallized it is what I've is my view on this and I, as I've spoken with prosecutors all across West Virginia we have great prosecutors out there doing some great work I think it's a force multiplier to have great relationships with our prosecutors 
But I will say this, I'm going to surround myself with investigators. That's what I did as the U.S. attorney. And what we'll do is we identify corruption, whether it's local, state, whatever it happens to be. We'll refer those out for prosecution. And we'll work hand in hand with local prosecutors on those prosecutions. That That's sort of the best of both worlds. It lets us uh, help local prosecutors on the investigative front while using a force multiplier. So we, we get to grow the attorney general's office through partnerships, not in any way of stepping on the toes of any local prosecutors, because I think they, they have incredible challenges that they're dealing with. But when we talk about things like Medicaid fraud, uh, corruption, certainly a big issue. I can tell you, I was the first one in West Virginia to prosecute two state Supreme Court justices for corruption. I suspect it wasn't the first time we had corrupt Supreme Court justices. And uh, this is probably more frequent than you imagine. Uh, I work in the heart of the swamp in Charleston. I see the effect of lobbying every day. And it's important that we have a perpetual presence in terms of identifying corruption and also identifying things like the child welfare system and CPS to make sure it works the way it ought to work. Too many instances of where it doesn't. But my view on this to answer your question is I want to work in great partnership, incredible partnership with our local prosecutors, even to the point that one, we're going to have a presence inside the attorney general's office of, of, the, of, of the state prosecutors so that I can know what they're thinking, get their advice, and seek their consent on a number of issues. But I think that partnership could be very powerful. Yeah, that's that's phrased differently or couched differently than what you initially said, which there's a lot of pushback with your initial statement. Well, I think you go through this, though, but you learn through the yeah, process, okay, yeah. and you dig into these issues, and I just see a, a better path. Yeah, you and I view a little bit different on what should be a state responsibility and what's a local responsibility. Uh, uh, DHHR uh, is heavily invested in the state. You mentioned the jail bill should be, or the jail should become a state problem. Uh, Berkeley County, Eastern Panhandle, has taken a very aggressive approach in trying to reduce the jail cost. And uh, we've done it through several different ways. We Our jail cost is manageable manageable but it's all local it's very very much local if it's all moved to the uh to the state level it's going to be just another state function and we always at the bottom end trying to say help us out help us out help us out we have no control it's all the state yeah so i definitely don't support what you just summarized which is let's just throw it to the state yeah. and grow another state agency yeah. that's not what i uh propose it's those dollars that are involved it's still going to be local control of those jails. It's still going to be local control and incentives in place to try to manage that. But I can tell you what's not working today is the current system. We have counties that haven't paid their jail bill in years. We have counties where 80% of the dollars available for infrastructure development, for schools, for libraries, for senior centers, is going to that jail bill. It's saddled, perhaps not here in Berkeley County, uh, but you're the exception to the rule. Uh, in most counties, it's a massive burden of massive uh, of massive magnitude. Okay. So talk a little bit, Mike, about how 100% pro-gun, pro-life, pro-coal, pro-gas, pro-parent, pro-vaccine freedom um, fits into this whole attorney general. I mean, that's a lot of pros for 100%. Um, fits into your role as attorney general? So I, th so I love your question. And so I think it's the big distinction between me and my opponents, not only the Republican opponent, but the Democrat opponents. Federal overreach, and it's been principally under this administration. We also had some under prior administrations, has fed in. It's very difficult today to mine our coal. It's very difficult today to be able to get our natural gas out of the ground. And you might say, well, what the heck does an attorney general have to do with it? How? Here's how. Uh, inflation, you may say, gosh, what's an attorney general have to do with inflation, the price I'm paying for the goods at the grocery store? It's very simple. If you can't get the energy out of the ground that helps produce every good at the grocery store, that gasoline for our cars, your prices are going to go up. This has become a huge challenge for our country. And so we're going to be very aggressive on the federal front. It, it, very similar to exactly what uh, Attorney General Morrissey has done in terms of challenging and working collaboratively 
with other attorney generals across this country. But a lot of folks may not realize this. Uh, Attorney general, I think it's the most important race on the ballot. It's not governor. It's not U.S. Senate. It's attorney general. Why? Because of the power to go into the federal court to challenge whether it's ATF trying to push back on pistol braces when they're assaulting on a daily basis our ability to carry firearms. And listen, I understand there's a range of opinion on this. You get some folks that are like, gosh, we need gun registries. We need to be able to track those people with it. I just disagree. And if you're on the side of wanting gun registries, if you're on the side of saying we need to restrict your ability to carry, don't vote for me. I'm definitely not the guy. So when we start talking about campaigners, I'm I'm a guy who's going to tell you genuinely where I stand. If you're with me, great. If you're not with me, I'm still going to fight for you, but don't vote for me. I'm not the middle. I'm not the middle. I'm a conservative. I've always been a conservative. My record, not only over a few years, and it's not just rhetoric. My record has been conservative for decades. Mike Stewart, Keep, yeah. I thought you were done, Mike. I'm sorry. If you, no, I was just going to say, my record has been there for a long time, too. So keep in mind, I was chairman of the state Republican Party. I was the founder of the Conservative Foundation. I reach across the aisle. I work with diverse interests. I, I don't surround myself with like-minded people who simply tell me what I want to think. I like to be challenged. I like good debate. We don't have enough of it today. I don't think those folks who disagree with me are my enemy. But I have my views on these things based on a lifetime of experience and certain the family that I've come from and my views of how we have to build West Virginia and my view of the proper role of government. It's not our keeper. We ought to be trying to expand freedom. There's personal responsibility, but there ought to also be personal consequence and personal accountability. That's why I say sometimes that I believe in redemption. I believe in treatment centers. I believe in giving help to those folks who seek help. But if you're a drug dealer, I also believe you ought to be behind bars. And I make no apologies for believing the revolving door, the revolving door at the prison is too fast, too quick, and we spend too much time talking about criminals and not enough time talking about victims. Where do we come with the dollars for the prisons? What you're suggesting we'd have would increase our prison population by by several fold. So let me ask you this question. Would you propose we put the dangerous criminals back on the street because it costs too much? It depends upon who the... It uh, can't dangerous. depend upon yes, anything. It, yes, it can, You can't Mike. put dangerous folks back on the streets. Well, if they are not dangerous, it depends upon the definition of dangerous. Well, what do you consider dangerous? Because I think if you're a drug dealer, uh, you're wreaking havoc across our community. You know, there's not a school, church... There's not a street, city, town. There's not a family that hasn't been impacted by the opioid crisis. Let me let me come back to my original premise, sure. my original question. How would you come up with dollars? You'd be building additional prisons throughout the state. Are you going to increase the taxes to do that? Are you going to redirect how you do it? It's awfully easy to say we're going to stop the revolving door, but in practicality, there is a cost to it. And and how would you cover the cost? So, but, but I, a minute so, and a half to go, Mike. So, but I love this question, though, because this is exactly the issue we've got to get past, the idea that we need to manage our budgets by throwing folks back on the street. We need to manage manage our prison population and manage our prisons by the need for that space with dangerous offenders. We should never be saying, let's put people back on the street because it costs too much. That's not right. Aunt Martha, who's going to the grocery store, shouldn't be looking over her shoulder to see whether a dangerous offender is going to whack her, try to steal her purse, or assault her because we're trying to manage the jail bill. That's crazy. Is there a major problem in that regard in West Virginia? Oh, my goodness. Crime is soaring across this country. You can look at the West numbers. West Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia, for sure. I can guarantee you. Look at the number of folks I prosecuted. You know, l- l- let me give you one example, because I need, I need a minute here. You have 45 seconds. <laughs> Sergeant Corey Maynard. In fact, I'll give you Abe Bain and Spessert, the troopers that served here as troopers in West Virginia that were shot in the line of duty, serving a, a misdemeanor warrant. How about Corey Maynard, who was assaulted, killed in the line of duty, ambushed in the line of duty? Look, that, that offender who shot Corey Maynard, that state trooper, had four priors. Each time he was released of his own personal recognizance. I wonder, would he be alive today if at one of those times he was held accountable for his actions rather than the empathy of all of us to say, let's just release him back to the street. Let's be nice to the guy. Let's focus on West Virginia and our families. 
Let, let's hold folks accountable for their actions. And, and that's a perfect answer to your question. I believe we'd have a state trooper alive today, potentially, if we would have held this guy accountable from day one. And, and Mike, on that note, we'll take our final break here and have 50 seconds left when we return with Senator Mike Stewart, candidate for attorney general. Hey, Mike Stewart, how do people find out more about your campaign? 15 seconds. They go to makewvgreatagain.com, makewvgreatagain.com. I urge you to go there. I'm the underfunded, super energetic, proven record, big time conservative candidate. And I'll fight for you and I'll be spending one day a week here in the Eastern Panhandle if we win this race because uh, all the candidates, they're either Charleston, one from Wheeling. You're gonna, you're not going to get an Eastern Panhandler. And that's it. We're out of time. <laughs> thank you. Mike, thank you. Bill, thank you. See you Friday. See you Friday. Maria, see you next week. Absolutely. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Tom.